Hello folks. I am ready. We have tea. I had to make it myself tonight then. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, let me just get my mic up. Hold on. Let's use the noise for a sec. Give it scrappy. Let's just put this on. As my audio guys. Folks, should I say, not guys. How's your week been so far? Mind you, it's not been a full week since we last um, did our stream. It's been since Friday, which is only a few days. Hi, Nori. Audio's good, excellent. Looks slightly high actually, but I haven't actually changed it. Could put too much sugar in my tea. Damn, I probably need the energy anyhow. Um, hope you've all been well. Hmm. Oh crap. What have you been up to, Laurie? Anything interesting? Oops, I just realised that's not right. That's better. <clears throat> Hi, O Post. Hi, Post. How are you doing? My data's wobbling a little here. I'm going from green to orange to yellow. It's not too bad, but it keeps dropping every now and then. Yeah, I'm good. Coping through lockdown. Hold on. Bear with me. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Oh, Laurie, my current FPGA project is redoing the code base of all my Z80 retro computers to make them consistent. Consistent with what? Consistent with what, Laurie? Consistent with a new Z80 or some project specific things. Um, let's do the forum stuff first. Yeah, I post. I'm going to talk about Fire 5 in a little bit. I don't know much about it, but I have seen it. Um, it's on my list to point to. Let's just do the forum stuff first. Uh, can I get my browser up here? Um, one of the things I've still got to work 
uh, act on is Hirosh has apparently done an update um, to enable you to identify which PMOD that you're putting a, um, uh, a line in. As he says here, I've modified the pinout from the ICO board to run with the Black Ice MX. You're able to determine the port via a UART. UART. You only have to put the wire into the port and you can see the port name on the screen uh, as long as you're catting the um, dev TTY USB zero from Black Ice, of course. Um, are you doing it from there? I've got to look at this yet. He's done a pull request, so I've got to have a look through this. But that useful looks useful for identifying what um, what P mod you're using. Helps de uh, decode that. Um, Come back to Laurie in a second. I've just finished the forum stuff. Uh, what was this? It was very interesting, which I haven't had a chance to follow up on yet. Steve Chamberlain explains his scheme for packing block ROMs full. So this is using nine bits rather than eight bits or something. I didn't quite understand this. It stores nine eight-bit bytes in eight nine-bit words of block RAM and provides an interface to read the data as if it were an 8-bit memory with a larger depth. Using this method, I'm able to store 1,152 bytes of read-only data per block RAM instead of 1024. The solution relies on the fact that the block RAMs of dual port, you can read from two addresses simultaneously, compare with using the same uh, number of block RAMs as standard in 8-bit wide ROM. This solution consumes an extra 54 LUT fours, 54 LUT fours, which is effectively 54 extra one bit uh, one bit memories. Sorry, one bit flip flops to get what is it, 20. Eight twenty-eight eight bytes worth of memory extra. Now, uh, does that work? I think this was a. What did he do this on? Was this on a Xilinx? Which did he do this on? I don't know what he's using here. Um, Mac X02. So he's using Lattice Mac X. Not sure how well this works on the other chips. It's something I'll have to have a look in. Did you see this at all, Laura, on the forum? Or have you tried it to see if it works on um, any of our current lattice chips that were supported? It's quite interesting. You need to squeeze a bit more out of your memory and um, packing uh, be interesting to know whether that works on say the ice chips ice 40 or the b5 so that's an interesting one um come back to that Uh, what else was on here? 
There was some talk about rewriting the um, Duino code so it works uh, with Black Ice MX, which is kind of cool. Wells is working on that um, to try and update it for uh, newer versions, newer STM32s that we're using. That looks good. Yeah, I think that's um, the most recent ones on the forum. So what's uh, Laurie saying here? Uh, no, but I think an early tiny FPGA board usage. Well, he's talking about expanding the memory here from 8 to 9 bits. Um, I can't remember what tiny FPGA, whether they used a Mac uh, X2. Can't remember. Possibly. Interesting, nevertheless. We'll have to uh, dig deeper in that one. Uh, what else is she saying here? So, Laurie's saying, so in response to, um, I asked him why he's uh, redoing the code on his Z80 retros to make them consistent. He says, each and other best practice. I built a template that runs on, I built a template that runs the RC2014 ROMs. I then plan to use it to build all of our computers and consoles. So for anyone that doesn't know, RC104 is um, um, is like a self-build Z80 retro uh, computer which you can get from Tindy. Oh. There is actually wait a minute, there is actually a website, isn't there now? Homebrew Z80 computer. Um, so that's what uh, Laurie's referring to when he says um, I built a template that runs the RC2014 ROMs. So in other words, on his uh, retro emulation, he can run the same ROMs that. Um, um, are being used on the RC2014. Which is a self-built uh, retro computer which is really pop popular. It's interesting that uh, Tindy is now advertising and that came up first the uh, latest one uh, I then plan to use the kit to build all of the other computers and consoles no, I plan to use it Build all the other right? Okay. Template. I would like to do a Black Ice MX template as well, but doing an on-screen display on the Black Ice MX is not easy. So I might wait for your ECP5 board. Um, That's because you have. To, is that because Laurie? Is that because you have to try and read the SD card directly in the Verilog, rather than um, asking the microcontroller for it? Yeah, you asked my controller for it. That's what I figured. Because we don't have the SD card connected on the uh, Black Ice MX, do we? And yes, you would have to change the firmware to do that.
Um, that's just a start. Uh, I then plan to use the template to build the ZX80 Spectrum, Sega Master System, and all of the other Z80 computers I've done. Cool. Oh, and doing it in MicroPython is much easier. Yes, it will be. Definitely. I concur. Uh, I have done a bit more, by the way, on the um, amalgam board. I'm getting there slowly. Um, it's funny, when you actually start finalising bits, um, then you start finding out you might be like a couple of pins short <laughs> or such. I had that issue over the last week with the amalgam. Uh, although I think I've solved it, I have to make some compromises on the features that I want on the board in order to uh, make the other features as good as I can. I don't think I'm losing anything um, significant. Um, but I'm just cleaning up things at the moment in terms of those features. Um, beware, my stream's going up and down like a yo-yo, so there may be some cutouts. But I am getting there with it. Uh, so that's some my storm stuff covered. Anything else that you guys want me to cover that's not already on the list? Uh, oh, I should mention, yeah, I'll do this as a segue. Let me put this in before I forget. So, uh, So I've lost something off the end here. It's very strange. Uh, it's because I've not got space. Dishway. Right, so going back to the schedule. Sorry. Let me get... Uh, let me just um, turn the browser off for a sec. Um, oh, Laurie says, uh, my Raspberry Pi Pico has not arrived yet. Well, neither has mine, strangely enough. When did you order yours, though, Laurie? And whom did you order it from? Did you get it from Pi Moroni? You ordered it on Friday. Was it Pi Maroni? Yeah. I can't remember when I ordered mine, whether it's Friday or Saturday. They said they shipped it, but we will see. And we'll come back to that in a bit. So uh, I've done the forum stuff. Um, sorry, let me take my... Um, top off here I'm actually warming up today it's been surprisingly warm albeit very wet here after the cold spot and the snow that has long since melted my post is opening it's asking if um, if it could be used to interface with the FPGA. Um, I presume he's talking about the Pico. Or the RP2040. The answer to that is yes. Um, 
I didn't think about it much on the stream on Friday, but over the weekend I did think a bit more about that. You know, if I was going to use it. Um, you, the answer is yes, it can. It could be very good for connecting up to um, the FPGA because you can use the PIOs to do um, quite a few different things. Even at a basic level, you could use it to do quad SPI or octo SPI so that you've got a reasonable throughput. But you could also have it um, do some event management as well, which would be very interesting. Um, having this kind of I.O. compute, if you like. Um, gives you some interesting options. We'll come back to the PIO stuff in a bit, I post. Did you catch the last stream, I post? I can't remember whether you were there or not. It was actually quite popular on YouTube. When I recorded it, quite a few people have watched it. Strangely. Um, moving on briefly, let's just go tour. Let's have a look at this. I, I saw this. I mean, you see all of these quite amazing um, um, quadrupeds nowadays, uh, you know, because of the cheetah. And stuff, you know, the MIT is it the MIT's cheetah? Let me just give you back the browser because I've turned it off here. Um, but I saw this was tweeted, which is a really interesting one, which is very low cost. And but this is several generations in. I did a little bit of investigation. Um, I can't find the details for the build, but um, in fact, I should be able to go directly to the uh, YouTube. This. Oh God, I hate you, Farage. Piss off. So this is the uh, YouTube video for it. And it's actually pretty simple when you look at it. But it's the way he sprung the legs, which is very clever. And it's obviously taken uh, a lot of experimentation. And you can see it's servo driven. If you look at the legs, but it's the tuning of the pids and the um, sprung legs that really make it magic as a kind of low cost way of doing it. I don't know which servos he's using either, but he's obviously got a nice little Bluetooth app as well. They're running on his phone to control this. So you'll have um, a servo in each leg to control uh, the um, the knee joint, if you like. Uh, but I'm not sure what he's using inside to control the axis of the leg, whether that's four servos or whether that's uh, other motors. My guess is servos. Given that the movement is very is a very small angle, um, And then you've not you've probably got another axis inside of that as well. <sighs> Sorry, I've turned the uh, audio off. This thing goes up to YouTube, I'll end up getting bloody copyright claims or something stupid. Um, but yeah, it's very interesting, very simple, um, but a very good implementation. <laughs> this makes me laugh. He's actually given you a camera shot inside it. Now, if you ever wanted a steady cam, this is a good application for it because it's horrible watching as it bounces up and down without any camera stabilization. 
but it's a very cool project. I really, really like it. It's by a chap called Martin Tr Trindell. I don't know who this is. I don't know much about him or about the project. I literally just came across it in the last few days on Twitter. But it's very, very cool. Uh, let me send you the link. Um, And apologise for my uh, stream going up and down. I don't quite know why it's doing that. It's very annoying. Bear with me a sec. Let me just check something on my router. Hold on. Right, back again. It might be other members of my household using the broadband. I have requested they desist. We will see. Um, okay. Right, uh, next on the list. This is interesting. Again, I haven't looked into much details, but I'm fairly impressed with this. I mean, um, one of the reasons I haven't looked at it in too much detail is because it's written in the... How do you pronounce it? Is it Silice? Silice? Not quite sure how to pronounce it. it we did look at this briefly. Uh, a few streams ago, but there's some quite fantastic claims here. So he's running, so he's developed this uh, Fire 5, Risk 5 core that he says validates 100 megahertz and still seems happy running at 200 megahertz on the ULX3S ESP5, which seems um, Pretty amazing. What do you think, Laurie? Could it be running at that speed? Silly ice. No, silly lice. What? Silly lice. Silly list. What? at the very top end of what's possible. Yeah, I mean, I haven't looked at it in detail because I haven't had time, and it's written in silly ice, or whatever they call it, which would make it even more complex to decode, but it looks really impressive. It says the pipeline SD RAM controller validates between 130 and 140 megahertz. And there's no problem at 160 megahertz. Wide read burst, 512 bits are great for the frame buffer. SD RAM chip is supported to be 143 megahertz. It's the same speed, I think, as the one we have on the MX. But runs five, fine at 160 megahertz as well. But presumably at 16 bits, so you can double that for the throughput. But then you've got to allow for the... Uh, Refresh and stuff. Silis. Silis. 
Is that how you reckon it's pronounced, I post? I'm not sure. So yeah, it looks quite interesting the way that he's doing it. Looks pretty impressive. He's put a cache in there as well, which is nice. Oh, and he's, yeah. And also, he's got a, you know, triangle generator. <laughs> uh, what happens he use? He's using an 85k. And um, what did he say he used? 14%. Not a lot, really. Definitely worth looking at. I don't know what chip that is he's talking about. Interesting, all the same. Impressive. Definitely worth keeping an eye on that. Um, so that's that. <sighs> right, so one of the other things I wanted to mention is... Um, on um, if we look at circuit python uh, going back to um So if we go back, sorry, I'm switching back now to the um, uh, RP2040, or in fact, in this case, this is, so I mean, you can get both CircuitPython have been released and also uh, MicroPython has been released for the Pico. Um, on, but there's... But when it comes to doing the PIO stuff, have you looked at the PIO stuff at all, iPost? Because I am going to dive into that in a bit. Um, now, you can do that from within Python. But the way that they're doing it in CircuitPython is very different from the way that they're doing it in... Um, uh, where did I see it? It was on um, an official microphone and circuit Python port. Let's just. No, no, I didn't want to go there. Hold on. Might be in... Um, Might be in the actual um, one of these uh, six six point.
bear with me I'm just trying to find If I go and look at the recent editions, um, trouble is it's so big now, it's difficult to, um, You can't see the wood for the trees in this lot. Uh, hold on. Maybe if I look at... How is that done? No. Issues. Hold on. Yeah, this is the same process of all reports. We're unfamiliar with getting it happening in this kind of things going. Multiply boys directly once it's clear the replay you can use these instructions. Add a new board no every discount tiny twenty forty no it's in the next few months. Okay. Pico, I'm hoping he's going to link here. GP15, he's going to. New display, circuit Python driver. Damn. Um. Bear with me, folks. Let me just um, there's more boards. Um, there must have been something before this, then. Uh, when was that? Nine days ago. Must have been more than that. MRTX. I need to look at that actually. Um, NRF ESP. Damn. What I'm looking for is, he did some examples on his stream that may well have just been part of his um, damn it, part of his own local, um, this is Scott's local, um, oh, this is annoying. It under here, look.
Well, maybe I go backwards the other way. Hold on. Let me just go back to where I came from. Uh, maybe it's under his um, his own Pioasm, here we go. God, that was hard work. I do apologize, folks. May have bored you all to death. Here's an example of how he's using it. Um, this isn't extensive as the one other one he showed, but anyhow, this is meant to be a simple one. So the way that um I don't know how, how much everyone knows about this. I know Laurie and I went through this on the last stream. Um, the one I'm looking at, sorry, Laurie, here is the, um, um, this, so this is on Scott's personal repo. So he's obviously the circuit Python build for the um, RP2040 is obviously done in his own repository right now. It's not on the main circuit Python repository. That's why I couldn't find it. So the way he, the, um, so yeah, for, if he didn't see the last, um, I don't know, if, don't know if you saw the last one, but yeah. So from within Circuit Python, you can directly assemble. I mean, all the assemble does is it assembles the assembler creates the binary codes that are necessary. Um, when you do that in the, you know, the SDK for the Pico, then it creates a C header file that you import and you can then, using the C slash C SDK, you can then, um, you can then copy those bytes, actually 16 bit um, instructions effectively, microcode or nanocode um, to the correct register inside the um, Pico, sorry, the RP2040 to store the program. Now you can do that in Python as well. And I think, uh, so CircuitPython wrote theirs, their assembler, which is very simple. It's a very small program, actually. I'll probably find it in a minute. But um, the way that they enumerate it actually in the Python is different from the way that they're doing it in MicroPython. Now, MicroPython was announced or the Pico version of MicroPython was announced uh, with the Pico. And they have a certain way of operating with this, which we'll have a look at in a minute. But um, in CircuitPython, they've done it slightly differently. So what they do here, so this is, you know, uh, what do you call this? I always forget what these are called with the triple quotes. Um, something string, can't remember what it's called, doc string or whatever. So um, it's basically just the textual version of the assembly. And then you simple, simply pass that into this um, PIO assembler uh, that, uh, that Scott wrote. Simple bit of Python. Um, you can then basically create an instance of a state machine using another class um, where, whereby you, you you pass in the assembled and then you pass in some of the control settings for the PIO state machine. Uh, so in this case, he's setting the frequency of the PIO peripheral clock to 80 megahertz. Um, I, I presume that's megahertz. Um, 
this is the initial instruction that's being passed in. You can actually make that part of the program if you want. Um, and then uh, he's passing in just a single pin in this case. You can actually pass in multiple pins. Um, so this actually loads it and starts it, I believe, in one go. So that's the way that they're doing it, which is quite nice. And let me just see if I can see. I could probably find the, um, so there's the examples. Uh, where is the asm? Did it say Ada and Ada fruit? So there you go, look. It's actually fairly short, this program, this assembler he's written. It's not anything particularly uh, complex. How many lines is this? Oh, it's got a bit longer, I think, since I last it. It's 165 lines, uh, of which, you know, 12 are comments. I don't know if how, how well he's checked this in terms of what it produces. Uh, but this this will be useful for some of the other things that I want to do when we play around with this. So you're welcome to take a look at that. Um, that's Scott, by the way. That's his repo on GitHub. So contrast. Uh, what were we looking at examples here? So let's have a look at a NeoPixel example because that's a I've seen this several times. Oh, this is the optimized version of it as well. So he's using wrap. So there's a lot less instructions. Yeah, the twenty forty has two cores and. The PIOs have four cores, four four state machines each. There's actually eight state machines, on each, one on each side. So again, he's doing the same thing here, but you can see some of the other things that he's turned on. So actually, that was 80, the simple one. He's actually running at 80. Because look, if you look here, it's 800 kilohertz. Yeah is it's actually hertz this frequency not megahertz yeah one of the things he was looking at laurie i thought was quite interesting so he was thinking because circuit python is mostly single thread right now unlike micropython so what he was thinking is he runs circuit python on um on one core and then um then he can run c on the other core the real time stuff as well as all the pio stuff which is an interesting way of looking at it um so on this example here you see a few more of the options so he's um he's setting a side set pin uh, it's doing the auto pull, so that means it just pulls off the data over the from the DMA from the FIFO every clock cycle. Uh, he's setting the shift register so it right shifts uh, for the output register. So that's, that's DMA from memory through the FIFO, then being shifted right out to the GPIO, and then here uh, the pull threshold is eight what's the pull ah, pull threshold is eight so what he's saying here is um there's eight eight pulls per shift out i think that means uh he's shifting out to d12 Yeah, it should be easy, All right? Although famous last words. 
we go on to that in a minute. So anyhow, that's now how they're doing it. So the key thing to note here um, is that he's doing his assembly as a string. Then he's passing that into his assemble program or function, whatever you want to call it, to return an assembled set of probably a list of bytes. It's probably not a list of bytes, actually, a list of words, effectively, or instructions. So bearing that in mind, um, let me show you something else. So if we look at the Python SDK, so this is the MicroPython. Um, an LD. It could be a byte array as well, I post. They love their byte arrays. Uh, in Python. So this is this is from Raspberry Pi themselves. So this is the Pico Python SDK from them. Now, if you look at the way that they do things, it's slightly different. Um, Right now, that's the normal peripherals. Hold on, let me find the um, PIO. So, they've taken a slightly different approach here. Um, let me just. Uh, get this big enough for you guys to look at so let's look at the way that they do it um, so first off uh, they use a decorator okay called the ASM PIO of which they can path in um, pass in the settings or initial settings etc so here they're setting the the uh, gpi output low to begin with and then they do do a, a function or method okay and then rather than you having like a string of assembly what they do is they have functions for each of the uh, instructions. And then that function for each of the instructions takes parameters, which are your operands, etc., or your side sets um, for these kind of PIO instructions. So, for example, uh, wrap target, that's not an instruction. This is this is a setup. Um, set pins one so that's setting in this case it's only a one pin output so it's only using one pin output so this set pin instruction really just sets that pin high and it does so uh, in a single clock cycle it doesn't wait then there are five no ops no operations so five clock cycles effectively so this is a really shit way of writing it of course which i'm sure they are just squeeze down in a minute then it's setting that pin to zero so this is like a kind of blinky basically and then at the end he's got the wrap so basically because there's like a 32 instruction uh program if you like um normally it would go to the end of 32 and come back around to the beginning but because we're using less than 32 in this you're using the wrap means when you get to the last instruction start from the beginning and then you don't need a jump um in this case um so this is really inefficient because what you probably do here is rather than set pins one you you'd say set pins comma one comma and then one two three four five to to wait five uh clock cycles and then the same for here set pins naught comma and then five 
to do that rather than having to write it out all individually. But the first thing you notice here is how different this is in MicroPython, your way of expressing these instructions, than it is the way that CircuitPython are doing it by using uh, a doc string that then gets assembled. And that's interesting because what you might be able to do here with the Python and MicroPython approach is you might be able to do something clever by combining those instructions. Um, so just in the same way, I'm thinking about having a meta CSP type construction level for my um, uh, IO FPGA stuff. You might be able to do something similar in Python for this, where you had uh, a meta expression of how to do it, and it turned it into these base instructions. So I could build an object in Python that contained these things, rather than just text. It contained something that might contain more metadata that enables you to do, manipulate things in a slightly different way. So it's very interesting, the contrast between the two different approaches. Um, and I just wonder if they're thinking a bit more vertically in terms of doing some abstraction above that in the MicroPython way rather than the CircuitPython way. I don't know what you think. Did you look at this at all, Laurie, the difference between the two? Um, then when they then then they have a separate, you know, actual instantiation here of the state machine, um, you know, by taking in the blink, which is the program, in this case, def blink, which is a function. Um, there they set the frequency and set base pin. So that here they're, um, this is like the first instruction. Uh, Laurie's saying he hadn't looked at the MicroPython method. Yeah. Uh, well, I've looked at both because I was kind of curious whether they would be the same or different. And clearly there's a fork in the road here and they're looking at it in a rather different way. And it's quite interesting. I'd say the MicroPython way is a bit nearer to what I was thinking. They can also do some other things here. So they're doing SM active time sleep, SM active zero. So they're actually activating and deactivating things as well, which is interesting. What's in this example here? So in it, PIO output low, default pass. Yeah, so what they're doing here is they're sending individual instructions. So in other words, this they're running it directly from uh, the local core when it's running the MicroPython. Well, Ipo says, uh, that's what irks me about CircuitPython, because they simply have to do things differently, often for no particular reason. Well, to a degree, they do have to differentiate themselves. Whether they just do that for that purpose or not is another question. Um, and maybe, I don't know how much exposure they had to how the MicroPython bit was done. I don't know if they had access to it at the time. I don't know how much they knew, so... Yeah, maybe they just thought they've got to get something done because they need to have circuit Python support out of the box and it wasn't necessarily revealed to them. I mean, the other thing is they can't use the latest versions of MicroPython. They're like at least a, a whole version behind. So they don't have the async IO and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, they can't just use what's there, which could lead them down that path in some cases. So this is quite interesting. Uh, 
Uh, they also support IRQs, which I don't think CircuitPython yet supports. Um, that's quite interesting. So basically, uh, I know that, yeah, obviously their uh, PIO program doesn't do anything here other than, you know, waits a few clock cycles and then fires the IRQ. Um, but they, what you can then do, I believe, is um, you can pass in a Lambda, a Python Lambda, that is called on the IRQ. I think that's what they're doing here. So this is where they're setting the program up, but with IRQs here. But then down here, they're attaching a Lambda to that IRQ, which is quite interesting. All it does is print prints the current tick time, but just shows you what's possible. Again, so that's a bit more sophisticated than Turkey Pipe from currently is. Um, I don't know if they talk about it at all here. I wonder if you see what I'd probably want to do is use the IRQ functions um, as an event mechanism. For example, if I attached it to the FPGA and have the information coming back, that in turn could then fire off that the IRQs could then be hooked into the async IO, the MicroPython. So I could all automate certain events which would be kind of interesting. I'm not sure there, uh, don't know if they've got any async IOs. What's this? Yeah. So there they're doing a, um, they're showing that same program uh, for driving the WS2812s, which is just stretching different stretched zero and one representations. Uh, but they're doing fade in, fade out, and they're dynamically changing the parameters here, which is quite interesting. Sending the RGB values. Um, I wonder if any of them use iSync IO. Sorry, I'm just scrolling through these at the moment. I don't want to go too much into detail in the software here today, because what I want to do is actually look at some of the hardware parts. But um, I just wonder why there's any. If I can do a find, have they done any async? MicroPython implements the entire Python 3.4 and additionally async await. Yeah, so I don't think they're using any of the async IO uh, in their examples, but it wouldn't be difficult. It's not a big step from using the interrupts and lambdas to uh, async IO. Um, anyhow, so I thought that was quite important is looking at the differences between the way uh, the support is developed in CircuitPython versus MicroPython quite an interesting contrast there how are we doing for time can't we've already been gone an hour so is there any questions on that I mean obviously I'm not an expert yet because I'm still getting my head around some of this stuff but before I move on to, you know, the kind of deep dive part of this um, on the FPGA front, uh, is there any questions on the stuff I've been over so far? It also gives me a good excuse to clean my filthy glasses that I can't see through.
What is your intention with the RP2040? Um, it's really just, um, I'm just being inquisitive about it. Um, I post, did you say that you saw last uh, the stream on Friday or the recording of it or not? You may have already answered that and I just missed it. I just don't know if you know what I said. So you did see it. Yeah. I mean, my interest is um, my past. Um, I did lots of work with things like Xmos and stuff, both open source and commercial stuff. And I was just very interested in the idea. As I say, I'm also working on some CSP stuff um, for test purposes and things. Although... If that works, then I can use it more generically later as well. And that might sit on top of something like NMIGEN, but that's more sophisticated. But at the moment, I'm just, I am under, interested in understanding how, what they've done, because it's just an interesting exercise more than anything else. And I just think it'd be interesting to kind of create it on an FPGA as well and be able to run the instructions on an FPGA. So if you wanted to use the same instruction set, so say you wanted to build a, you know, a VEX RISC, RISC V, and you wanted to have state machine support for your IOs that was compatible with these instructions, you know, how easy or difficult would that be? So it's an interesting learning exercise more than anything. I'm not in the business of creating uh, a compatible microcontroller but it might be useful from an FPGA sense and it could be just fun more than anything else really so my intention with the RP2040 isn't anything particular it's just a curiosity really um, and if we can do a kind of FPGA version um, for doing compatible running compatible instructions that would also be quite useful I guess it's, it's just curiosity, really, more than anything else. Um, so let's dive into that. So what I want to do, I just updated my... Um, we do the same thing we did with the stepper stuff. We start off with iStudio to try and lay some stuff out. I've already made a little bit of a start on this, but... Um, let me see if I can get this uh, up and running. Hello. What did you want? I am, yeah, but Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um right, so uh I think I just ran my studio. Why can't I see the windows? I haven't broken it, have I? Let me try it one more time. That's kind of weird. It worked this time. Um, Yeah, let's do this, shall we? So, um, the reason I'm, I I don't normally use this to do the development with, but um, it's quite good from a visual point of view when you're starting off. So, let me get it on the screen. That would be helpful. Uh, yeah. Okay. 
Um, Let me get the data sheet up as well because I'll need that from the uh, Raspberry Pi. Pico. arranging some windows here people I'm not sure how easy it is to do this uh, hold on right hold on So just to let's just um, remind ourselves of the architecture before I do this. Hold on. So um, the way that this uh, the internals of the PI. PIO is controlled is via a um, a series of state machines. There's four state machines on each side and 32 instructions. To then control them. Um, there's also a cascading IRQ system. Um, one of the things I'm not sure about they haven't I don't think they've done anything particularly clever with the intercommunication or messaging and signaling between the units but the IRQs apparently can be used in some way to do that I haven't looked into that in more detail but if we focus for a moment on the um, so what happens is the, the FIFO is used as a buffer between the memory either via DMA or, or direct writes and the state machine that provides the data. It, it uses an in and out command to pull and push to and from. So the FIFOs have a receive and a transmit. Um, but what we're interested in here is this puppy. So this is what the state machine looks like. So it consists of uh, an out shifter, an in shifter, a scratch X and scratch Y. So the scratch X and Y are really just registers. The out shift and the in shift are shifters that can shift left or right and can shift in different amounts. To and from the FIFO, you can either write to them directly or um, you can recycle, I think, some of the bits. Uh, the PC here is the program counter for that 32 bit, 32 instructions. Each instruction is 16 bit, by the way. And then you've got a fractional clock divider as well here. Uh, that's good for when you want to do UART rates and stuff like that. Um, and then there's some logic for controlling, for, co for orchestrating all of the different parts. Plus, it's got some flags and things in, I believe. So let's look at. Uh, doing that um, because that's what I'm interested in right now I'll keep that to one side so we can keep that in mind um, and let's just switch over to uh, iStudio so we've got something visual to play around with this 
Um, having updated, it gives me a nice notification. So let's cover a thing of these. Has anyone heard of the Ice Sugar for board before? That's quite an interesting board that has some P mods on. It's an up uh, 5K board. I think it has an FTDI interface from memory. Um, I had noticed that one. So new features, Ice Build Folder. Oh, you got one, have you, iPost? Cool. Uh, every time you upload some size so design, the ice build folder is created to an intermediate set of files, very files, constant PCFs. Have a look. Okay, I will do. Um, I still haven't tried this. The ice rock data file capture that's built in, they've enhanced this. Uh, it's available in the ice build folder. So if it captures the data, it keeps a local copy. Um, again, I haven't played with this stuff yet, but it's an interesting one. Um, we should visit that at some point when I actually learn it. Um, Python environment manual setup. So you can actually point it at your uh, the Python environment that you want, which is good. Uh, this is quite interesting. And again, I'd like to check this out at some point. Maybe we'll get a chance later. The Verilog generation, which is a bit nightmarish, actually. Uh, now contains block name and descriptions added into the Verilog output that helps you find your way around it. Otherwise, it's really, really rather ugly, I found, what, what it outputs as Verilog, which is why I don't use it for any final thing. I use it really for visualization because um, it generates all these horrible numbered things that are just incomprehensible. But having the uh, comments and descriptions in there may, may help that a little bit. Um, so what's the super nano nano I post? I know that Dave was looking at doing something different. I assume it's a he, it might be a she, of course. Uh, added scroll bars to select menu, ice memory collection. So ice examples, and these are just blocks for different things like display driver, etc. etc. Okay, so we can get rid of that. So what's the, what's the uh, oh sorry sugar nano not super nano I'm reading it wrong. What what chip do they does he use? Is it is, does he use an LP chip? I think I might have seen it seen him post on Twitter or something. I post. Damn, I'm out of tea again. I might have to go for a tea break in a minute. It's a 1K, yeah. It's an LP 1K. I think it's in one of the smaller packages as well. Right. So what I'm thinking here is, what does it look like? If we were going to build a PIO compatible inside the FPGA so it could be used as an option as part of, say, an MMIGIN build or something, uh, or part of a IPEX base, what would it look like? Um, so... We need to create some blocks for this. In PIO, what is the API for getting data in and out of the FIFOs from the microcontroller? Well, you can either write via register or you can just DMA from memory location. Um, let me, I can show you actually. Um, If we look at the, um, sorry, let me just turn off the iStudio, you might see this. You look at the WS2812, so this is not in answer to uh, Laurie Griffith's question. So in the PIO, again, I can only show you the MicroPython example here, it might be slightly different than MicroPython. In, in the PIO, what's the API for getting data in and out of the FIFO from the microcontroller? So here the example is. So they've done the driving the um, WS812 LEDs program. And you've probably already seen that in their manual. 
Uh, it's basically stretching the bits to get the same. But the way that they talk to it is display a pattern on the LEDs via an array of LED RGB values. So they get an array here. Okay. And then basically the, the call here is SM put where they send uh, an array. of is that eight bytes i guess i think that's the maximum that the fifo um apologies sorry i didn't realize it was still over the top i have two windows on obs and you sometimes get mixed up between the two can you see it now so here what they're saying is so this is the program for the uh, wp sorry ws 28 one twos okay now if you look down here what they're doing is they're creating an array here and they're setting up the colors and then the key thing is as they're going through these they're using state machine dot put and then the array right and then i believe that's how many um how many bytes or is it words I think it because I think it stores eight. The FIFO is eight 32 bits, eight times 32. So the AI must be 32. I mean, it's RGB values. So yeah, so it's very simple. So here they're putting them. But I don't know underneath if they're using DMAs to do that or not, or whether this is doing it individually. It doesn't actually talk about that here. It doesn't express that. Uh, you aren't. Yeah, they're just using put. Again, it's all SM put and SM get. Now, I don't know whether they're using, whether these, it's doing it byte by byte, or whether that underneath is using um, some form of DMA, because DMA is most definitely supported. Um, but you can often hide that in MicroPython or CircuitPython. Anyhow, that should give you a partial answer with any luck. Sorry, back to where we were, my studio. Uh, there's a vote here, a vote yeah or vote yeah. <laughs> Did you mean to do that I post? So your choice is yes or yes. <laughs> I wasn't intending on going through the MicroPython source at this point in time, but you're welcome to. <laughs> okay, so back to the iStudio stuff. Hold on. Uh, so what I was going to do is create some blocks. So I've already created some blocks, some empty blocks um, here. Um, How does a block hold on? Um, I 
again I'm not completely au fait with the way that iStudio and the way it updates things but anyhow let's just make an assumption here this is going to work uh, this isn't visually very helpful so let me open let's just change the uh, scratch register thing first okay no 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 I didn't do that scratch register thank you um because what I forgot to do here was do the naming I'm interested to see if it will update it if I'm updating this uh. <sighs> mm, okay hold on bear with me a sec Hold your horses. Mm, 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 mm. Damn, you can never find things when you want them. Bear with me, I'm just trying to find something um, appropriate. Big problem. Yeah. I wonder if I can use this. When you want something, you can't find it.
Sorry, this is slowing me down a little bit. Where with me? Try not to waste too much time on this. Thought I'd be able to find this easily. Doesn't show me the types of image, making it harder. Oh, how annoying. Oh, let's just use this for a moment. I don't like it, but... Oh, why does it keep doing PNG images? This is really annoying. It'd be nice if I had a text to the SVG function. Hold on. Let's use this for the moment. Okay, so if we go back to this, how do we get it to know that I've changed something? Right, just some teething issues here. How do I know? No. We will get going with this shortly. Um, so I've just updated this, but for some reason, so if I double click on this, shouldn't it show me what the latest version is? Hold on, I've just got to open another window. Let me just, um, I'm just going to type something in to see if it actually changes it. Bear with me. Let's 
save that block. Right, now if I go back here and I look at that block, I can't. Um, have you used uh, iStudio before, Laurie? I know I have before, but what I'm not sure about here is whether it actually updates the... Um, so if you change the block, which is in a separate file, how do you get it to realize that's change and reload it in the sheet. Is there like a command or something? Because it doesn't seem to notice it automatically. So for one of these blocks, so so this one I'm selecting here, Laurie. Um, I obviously brought that in as add block, right? But I can actually go in and open that block and edit it. And having done so and saved it, when I come back to here and then open it up, it doesn't seem to have changed. I mean, I can unlock it. I don't know whether that makes any difference, but that just enables me to write and change it. But what I want it to do is actually update um, from before. All right, so let, all right, let's, The other thing is, it's really difficult to delete things here, but you can actually cut them. So can I? When I'm in here, can I do something? I understand it being read only, but surely it should be connected to original block. Once I've got a block in here, right? What's that? Cut Control X. I can't seem to get hold of it to actually get rid of the damn thing. Maybe I can undo. Do it like this. Now if I bring it back in, hold on. Does it check? Uh, what was I doing? Scratch register. Yeah. So when I bring it back in, I can see it's different. And if I look at it now, it's got a command in. Trouble is if I go in individually change that <laughs> it doesn't update oh how infuriating um that makes it a bit more difficult i thought this was going to be easier to use this way Right, okay, we're going to do it the hard way, and then we'll combine it at the end. It's going to be a lot less visible. Okay, let's get rid of that. Right, so let's work on the different parts, components. So this block is the scratch block. Um, just to remind you, oh, I've made this bigger and I shouldn't have done that. Sorry, let me squeeze this back into here. It's interfering. Right, yeah, we do it manually. So what I wanted to do was put all the blocks together in one page so I can recreate what you're seeing here. And then as we go and update the bits, see them 
change here, but we can't do that. We have to do that at the end. So I'm going to go into these individual. So uh, let's look at the first component, which is a scratch register, because we're going to need two of those. Um, so um, the other thing I need, oh dear, oh dear. I think I'm going to need to squeeze some stuff in here a bit better. So if we look at those, so what do we know about these? Scratch registers. Um, so we, each of these, uh, there's two of these scratch registers and they are 32 bits. They're called X and Y. Um, they can be the source and destination for both in or out set or move. So they, they're parallel loaded, both in and parallel loaded out, uh, stored and loaded in parallel. So the interface should be fairly simple. So what are we going to need for this? Uh, so let's have a look at this. Is this going to be big enough, guys? Uh, so if we look at the IOs that I'm adding on here, let's just, it's a bit wider. Yeah. So my IOs are already set up in this case. So we have a clock, the port clock coming in. Um, well, I'm, I'm, it, it, it's a combination of both uh, iPost. iPost is asking, are you looking for just diagramming or actual HDL? Um, I'm kind of doing both here. Um, the iStudio gives me a visual representation, which is good for the stream, but I can also start working out some of the HDL requirements. I mean, what I want to do is I want to do this in mmigen rather than Verilog in the, at the end of the day. I can't do that in iStudio, but I can start working out what's required, and then it gets quite easy to translate that into mmigen after. Um, so the, the, the inputs here, so we've got the port clock, um, which will be after the division section. So you've got clock and then you've got port clock, which is fractionally divided. Um, we've got data in. So we know we need it to be 32 bits. So we've got a data bus in of 32 bits and we've got a strobe signal, which can be used to load the register. Um, I don't know if that's the preferred terminology here. Um, I quite often use strobe as a kind of default way of clicking in data. Um, you could use write if you wanted and read. I'm just trying to keep it simple. And then the output port is a data out. Again, same same depth. It's a 32-bit output. Um, and you can see that diagrammatically here, the clock coming in, the data in, the strobe to clock it to uh, uh, bring it in and to say it's valid data. And then data out. Okay. Uh, and what we do is we have the data out constant so it can be read on the clock from the outside. So, um, in order to do that, then, so the output side, we just keep really simple. Uh, let's do that. So, basically, the data out just reflects what's in the current data register inside here so it's a 32-bit register um, to get the data in 
that's going to be fairly simple. Uh, always, uh, uh, damn it. I hate this. Why does it always switch the keyboard back? Because I restarted earlier. Does my head in. Uh, positive edge of P clock. We do everything relative to P clock. Uh, begin. And then we do an end. Um, what should we have in here? We need to basically um, load the data in, but we only want to do that um, when we get a strobe. So we can just simply for the moment. A lot of this is simple. When it comes to it, we have to do, we may have to do more kind of synchronization, but let's assume everything's in the same clock at the moment. So uh, the other parts that this attaches to. So strobe. So when that's high, then we're going to load in from the outside the uh, um, um, 32 bit. Oh, damn it, what am I doing? Look at what you're doing, Mr. Uh, data. That's what I want. Mm. Still getting used to this daft keyboard. Ooh, that's going to be from data in. Simples. So it saves this block. Better do the old verify. Make sure it's not upset with that. Oh, it's upset already. What have I done? Syntax. Oh, I'll tell you what I haven't done. Oh. Pause edge. Oh, Christ. It's my typing, isn't it? That's why it's always worth running the verify on it. So that should probably do as a register. Thank you, Ipo. Sorry, I didn't see your comment. Yeah, just being daft. It's been a while since I've written any Verilog. I've been in Enmigen land recently. You forget very quickly. Um, okay, so that's probably simple enough for the moment. Let's leave it like that. So let's save that. Okay. So now I want to open, let's have a look at the program counter. Um, I hope the way the windows change on this. Yes, lots of it. You know, I've always thought of doing an alternate uh, you know, so you've got MicroPython, CircuitPython. Well, mine's going to be Monty Python. Because <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Um, that's where the name actually came from originally, I think, wasn't it? Monty Python, not the snake. That's why the way they came up and named it. Yeah, I need to look at uh, Silis, Silas, when I get some time. Um, what do we want to do? We want to do. Okay, something else that I have to do here before I forget. Let me. Um, where the hell did my browser window go? 
uh, um, Just going to give this a nice um, name and stuff. Hold on. Program. Will help later, believe me. Counter. Right. Right, so for the program counter, so in terms of the inputs and outputs, um, obviously I've got the uh, port clock. Um, then I've got wrap. I'll come back to that in a minute. I've got the address output, which is... Uh, 32 instructions, so that's kind of a five bit um, output. Okay, I post you. Yeah, I'll see you in a bit if you get a chance to come back. I'll be going for a little bit yet. Um, do I need the width parameter? No, I don't. Let me get rid of that. I know what I was thinking there. Um, so the wrap parameter I'll explain when I get to that in a second. We need to be the wrap parameter is a way of um, auto jumping or wrapping around. So that gives me the instructions, the instruction point at which we wrap, which will be the end of the program. Okay. Um, so what we're going to need, we're going to need. Uh, let's do the. Uh, program count uh, for the instruction that we're on. That needs to be, hold on, it's a five bit, isn't it? Um, I think I can do that. No, it's five bit, what am I talking about? Not six bit. Um, what else do we need? All right, so always uh, at pause edge. Let's do pause edge clock. Pause edge. P clock. Um.
What are we going to do first? Normally here we just want to increment the counter. Um, however, because we've got the wrap, we need to check for that. So if um, the count as we're going up is equal to the wrap, i.e. the instruction number that we've passed in. Oops. That means we're getting to the end. That's the, that's the last instruction of the program. So in this special case, uh, we're going to set, we're going to zero the count, right? Back to the first instruction. Synchronous uh, assignment. Uh, do we want, yeah, yeah, we are counting up, so zero. And if that isn't the case, in all other cases, we will just do increment. I'm being lazy here. This isn't the best Verilog code, by the way. I don't want that two in there. Done it again. Bloody keyboard. I will get my head around this eventually. Um, so in this case, we will we will increment count. Just increment it by one. So on each clock cycle, we'll increment the program counter. The exception is if count has reached what is the wrap signal coming in is, i.e. the point at which we wrap in the instructions, then it will reset and go back to the beginning. So it's kind of a shortcut. Yeah, I've got to work out the jump as well. Um, and I'm just thinking maybe my naming's wrong here. Mm. Jump is an instruction. So that's handled outside of the program counter, but it manipulates the program counter. And it even manipulates it by setting a wrap. Um, what I'm wondering, Laurie, here is can I use the same? 5-bit bus to convey both the wrap and the um, and the jump. Difference being that jump is dynamic, wrap is only done at the start. But I probably need two because wrap is going to stay constant. Hmm. Do I need to use do I actually? Oh, in that case, actually. Mm. I mean, what I could have is wrap. I could have, hmm. another way of doing it, of course, might be. Let me go back. Is it awkward to do this when you're not in a text? Oh, come on. Another way of looking at it might be address and then two other inputs jump and which are one bit wrap.
jump address or wrap address. Hmm. Uh, the jump is going to come from the program instruction, whereas wrap is really just set up at the beginning of running. But let's say um, Yeah, I'm going to have to change this to be more generic. Let it be more clear. Um, Um, else if count equals mm. So what I'm thinking here account so So wrap does that come in as an instruction? Could it be seen? I'm just the thing that worries me is I lose an instruction. I lose a clock cycle to load the wrap. But let's let's just stick with that for the moment because I can work that out afterwards. Um, uh, so what I want to do here is just deal with um, uh, loading this up. So if um, wrap
Okay, so um, let's get this some time posing. So basically, if I'm sending the wrap signal, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. It will load the address that's presented on the address in. Um, and set up the wrap wrap address, which I should put here actually. Register. So that's set. So if that has been set, then when it's going through the count, if it e equals the wrap address, um, then the count will return to zero. And really, the initial should be, I mean, we're calling it wrap, but actually that's really a better way is end uh, program end Uh, you think it's so by default the end is the last last instruction if you don't have any wrap So that's um, okay. So initially, that's the last instruction, the end. So when it's chap, if it if it. Program counter um, reaches the end, it resets the count to zero. So that works by default, and by default, it's set to the last instruction. Okay. Alternatively, if we get a wrap signal, we can change the end address, the last instruction address, by setting the address in on here and taking the wrap high pin for a clock that will then set the p end address to whatever the address is in is that we set the wrap and that covers this this situation otherwise if that isn't true we're not at the end of the program um, if the count equals uh, sorry if jump, if we've received a jump instruction, i.e. the jump signal is taken high, we set the count to the address that's also presented on the address in, which tells it to jump to that place, because that will be the operand of the instruction that's sending the jump signal. And if we don't do any of those, we just increment the count. Does that make more sense? Um, Laurie? We've accounted for jump then, haven't we?
Uh, is there anything else that can set the um, program counter? You can't directly manipulate the program counter, can you, with the move instruction? Hold on. Does it talk about the program counter? Scratch register, shift counters. Registers. The only thing I'm wondering is if you could actually manipulate the program counter itself. Not via an instruction, but via something else. It seems unlikely. Jump seems the only logical way of doing it. Now, I can't see anything else in there. Let's make the assumption that is the only way of changing the program counter then. Either using the end of program, which can be modified by the wrap setup, or by issuing a jump and presenting the address to jump to. That should cover us then, I think. Let's just do a save on this. Do we need to do anything else on the program counter, do you think? Okay. Jump should probably be tested before penned. Oh, because it could be the last instruction. Good point. Good thinking, Batman. Just uh, tell it to verify that. I've probably done some typos in here. And ah, semicolon. Of course, I'm a daft. Yeah, that'll probably do. Happy with that, guys and girls. <laughs> Refreshment required. sure how much of this we're going to do we're already in a two hours and 20 minutes in right let's leave that then for a moment i'm happy with that let's just quickly go on to the hard bits now <laughs> having thought about this i'm pretty sure that the shift parts are harder let's have a look at the output shift part first um Bear with me. Bear with, bear with. Mm. 
Right, in terms of inputs and outputs at the moment, um, I've got a 32-bit data path in. That's the data coming in, effectively, from the uh, FIFO. In fact, let me see if I can... Um, There's a diagram there. So we've got uh, information coming in from the FIFO with a pull signal that's coming from our instruction. Uh, we've got the clock, obviously, port clock. We've got left, not right, because we can shift in either direction. So that needs to be externally controlled. I think that's a setup control, but anyhow, let's just leave that for a moment. Um, the pins configuration is tells us which pins we're going to be activating, sending out. And that can be up to thirty two basically pins. I think it might even be thirty one, but anyhow, that's, we've got enough room for thirty two. And then uh, an out signal, like a strobe or whatever. Uh, do we want to call it out? What would we call it? Just leave it out for a moment. I can always change this afterwards. And then the output port, when the out is requested as an input to get the output because we're shifting. And it can be up to 32 bits wide, the output. Right, let's have a think here. So um, we're going to need some registers. 32 bit registers. Uh, Internal data register. What else we're going to need? Let's have a register for data out as well, I think, probably. Um, Uh, hold on. How do we know how much to shift? Output shift from the whole data output between the FIFO. Hmm. So this is how many bits we're looking at shifting. That's an operand, so it's dynamic. Uh, Come back to that. We're going to have to break the shift up into sections. Um, uh, what else do we want? Huh? I am. Uh, 
Okay, I'm going to have to come back on that. I need to think about how we're going to do the shifting. I hate shifting. Right, let's just put do this first because this is a bit clearer. Let's just deal with the um, input size of things. So let's just get that covered. And then I'll have a little go with the shifting. Um, oh. So what we're going to do is look for the pull instruction, uh, aren't we? So if 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 pull is high. Oh. Um, uh, data, just load the data register from data in, let's latch it in. I think. And then so in other words, if we get a pull signal, a high signal, we need to load the data in from the FIFO from here. Uh, let's have a look at the output as well. So if we have the out commands, um, this is going to be much more tricky. Uh, I want peacock. Uh, Do, 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 do. What do we want to? So, if we receive the out signal, right? Out goes high. Then we need to do some stuff. We need to do several bits. So, let's just create a section here. What do we need to do? Um, our data out needs to be Twinkle. You just finished your supper. <laughs> Come say hello to the folks. Hello. I know you're saying hello to me and then I'll let you out. Hi, this is Twinkle. Streaming. You know, internet. Cats are good at that. Try not to catch my mic I'll let you out go 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 um, so the data out I need to assign to the data out and what I want is the shifted bits what's difficult here is that the number of bits that I'm taking from the data internal register is programmatically decided by one of the operands. If we look at something like this here. Yeah. So it's not like a fixed thing. So I'm going to need to uh, do something like sign. I need a shift mask so I can take off the least significant number of bits dictated by how many pins. 
I'm using. Uh, and that is going to be I know I can do this. This isn't really a mask, it's the opposite of a mask. It would do as a cheat. I'm sure a lot of this can be optimized by the way um, later. It's just to get the idea across really. Um, then we need so the data, the maximum of the data, if we imagine we wanted the entire data, we need to our mask would be one 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 one. Okay, so that would be uh, thirty-two. Really, how oh, I need it? Eight Fs, don't I? I think. X. I'm not going to do that bugger in binary. It's huge. I mean, you could do one minus or whatever. It's a cheat, but this just makes it clear. And then I can use a shift mask here to mask off the least significant bits as wide as the shift mask. Invert it because. What this will give me is it will shift the ones out and insert zeros in the end. The number of zeros it inserts will be down to the number of pins. So that will give me a one, 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 followed by however many zeros there are as the number on pins, which is input here, which is a five bit. Uh, number but I need that to be inverted because I, what I want to do is I want to add that with the data uh, register thus see where I'm coming from by ending it with the shift mask, or in this case, the kind of the opposite of a shift mask, it's inverted. So only the ones, where there is a one corresponding to the bit of data, which is 32 bits, that are the bits that are going to be shifted out, i.e. pins width number of bits, um, those ones will cover everything else will be zero. So data out will only contain, even though it's 32 bit, will only contain where there's ones created by this, masked by this. So if pins was four, it will be the last four bits. Everything else will be zero. But I need to do more than that. I can't just do that. I have to change the output because I've shifted otherwise we just end up shifting the same thing out so data itself must also change and that needs to be the shift or in fact it's going to yeah shift of data by can I just do um, just do this? I think so. The new value of data will be shifted by pins number of bits. Mm. Shift mask is not designed. Oh, right, okay, I need a wire for that. That's that's combinational operation. So uh, um, and that's got to be thirty two bits as well. Okay. Yeah. 
Yay, like that. So if we're doing an output, we're shifting the pins number of bits in data out and then that data register itself is shifted to the right. Oh, I know. Wait a minute. We have to keep track of how many we've shifted. <sighs> Need another register. So, I mean, the shift could be one bit. So it could be up to. Need to count up to. Am I counting the number of bits that I've shifted? Or the number of shifts that I've performed. Maximum number of shifts are 32. Right. In other words, if I was only shifting one bit out, like a serial SPI or UART. So that would be... Um, will count me up to 32 where well, I want to shift count I've seen this mentioned somewhere actually that you've got to keep control of this mentioned that somewhere in the text I remember let's have a look at the text Output shift register holds and shifts output data between TX FIFO and the other things such as scratch this pull out instruction OSR fills with data as it's shifted out. Yeah. The state machine will automatically refill the OSR from the FIFO on an out instruction if hold on. Can't read all that. on an out instruction once some total shift count threshold is reached if auto pull is enabled so yeah we do need to um, keep track of that stuff shift left and right is configurable by our configuration rest registers Uh, shift counters, some more stuff here. State machines remember how many bits in total have been shifted out of the output shift register via out instructions and into the ISR via in instructions. This information is tracked at all times by a pair of hardware counters capable of holding values from 0 to 32 inclusive the width uh, the width of the shift register the state machine can be configured for certain actions when in or out count reaches configurable threshold DOSR can be automatically refilled once some numbers of bits have been shifted out the ISR can also be emptied the bits have been shifted push pull instructions can be conditioned on the input or output shift counter PIO reset. I'm not dealing with research yet. Shift counter is clear to zero. I haven't accounted for that. I need to think about resets. And the OSR shift counter is initialized to 32. Nothing to be shifted out. Some other instructions affect shift counters. So what they're saying is this should be. Uh, Hmm. 
should be initialized to that value. Should do an init section really. I might have to change that anyhow. Um, on PA reset, uh, oh, so I've initialized 32, nothing remained to be shifted. Some other instructions affect shift counters. Pull clears the output shift counter. Oh yeah, of course. So when we do a pull, we must clear it. Um, uh, shift oh, count. The, the, the documentation is actually quite good. It's making this a bit easier in some ways. The, but we're bound to hit something where that's not the case, of course. But generally, this is quite cool. <clears throat> Clears the output shift counter. When they say cleared, they mean reset it back to top. Or just a zero. I think it's zero. So that would be. Um... Oh, what are doing? <laughs> yeah. So if we re reload the data in, obviously we need to. We finish shifting out, so we need to. Reset that or pull, but it also mentions some other cases here as well, which are a bit more complicated. So, move OSRX clears the output shift counter, move SRX clears the output shift counter. So, what does move OSRX do? Is that a side effect or is that does that load from the X scratch register into the OSR or something? <laughs> so there's another case where we want to do this from a move signal. I mean, we could add, I'm still trying to understand this really, out and right, left, right, three clock pull. Could have a move signal here. If we move, we don't do a read, though, do we? Yeah, so maybe it should be the other way around. Well, we can't have pull or move. It's either one or the other, so yeah, we should be all right, actually. God damn, it's getting tiring, getting late. Maybe starting to lose my marbles. Um, let's just put this in now because I do need to account for this somehow. So, it's still with us, Laurie, on this one, and everyone else that's watching. I post. Oh. Christ, just know it's a typo. So I'm resetting shift count. It's two situations where it shifts. So when we do a pull of data in, we're resetting the shift counter. And if we're um, receiving the move command again, we need to reset it. iPost is back. Cool. You need some begin and ends. 
what for the if and else I do. You're right for the if. I can. Uh, not for the uh, else if though. Although that might be your style. The other thing I need to do is when I um, have done a shift, I need to update the shift count, don't I? I need to increment it by the amount I am shifting, i.e. pins amount, right? Plus whatever it was before. Told you this bit was going to be the complicated bit, and we still got a lot more to account for yet. I think behaviour-wise. Laurie says I was wondering about using this when it's finished. Hmm. Whilst I think about that, and whilst I remember, I should probably update the um, project information as well. Uh, And find an icon. <sighs> yeah, maybe it's not in the right place. luck with that. Um, Okay. 
Um, just catching up with the chat. Sorry, I'm just adding some meta stuff to the um, ice block. Uh, I was wondering about using this when finished. Really needs a 32-bit CPU to drive it. Yeah. For MMIGEN, the Minerva CPU and SOC is possibility. Isn't there a 32-bit VEX? Uh, or an SPI 32-bit memory interface for MicroPython Mac possible? Yeah, which is what I was thinking of doing to test it with. Sorry. You know, just using SPI or Quad SPI to, to do the testing with. Um, we do simulation and all of that well before we put this on an AFPGA. Um, my post says the SPI option sounds good. Uh, Laurie says we use that a lot in the ULX3 for OSD, etc. What SPI? I notice when we go to do the input shift register, look, it's got this. You can actually set the count directly. It's interesting. Spy memory address data. Yeah, no, spy's good for that. As we know from doing the stepper stuff, etc. Okay, so the shift counters, so. State machines remember how many bits done out. So we've taken uh, taken care of those bits. I think we have some of the functionality, and this might be a good point to bring this to a close. I think now before I totally lose my marbles because it is getting late. We can do some more of the PIO stuff next week, just out of interest. Right, so let's just save this. I'm going to save this and I'm just going to do something else as well. See if this still works. Remember I said before when we build the um, uh, the actual thing. I know we can't do it dynamically, but. Lex is 32 bits of you, but combine it with MMIGEN components as complications. Yeah, maybe. Sun's just set where I post is. Where are you? States. Um, have you, Laurie, have you used um, Minerva at all yet? MMIGEN one. Because I haven't had any time to uh, play around with it. Are you in Florida? I post nice. Bet your weather's a bit nicer than it is here. You built it and got it to run. Okay, cool. Um, hold on. So let's just add these blocks in. See if they pick up the um, meta information now. I'm curious. Yay! <laughs> Although this is disposable because um, because unfortunately, as soon as I do this, I, once I change the others, this can't see the changes. Or it might do if I reload them. That'd be an interesting thing to try. I'm not going to do that now because well, ah. <laughs> hey, look, we've got our <laughs> 
see there's our program counter at the bottom shift output shift register it's picking up the metadata points current instruction uh, PIO scratch register that could be X or Y we probably need to give it a labeling of some sort I post, I guess, uh, sorry, I post just telling us where he is about two hours north of NASA. I bet you don't get to see the launches from there, right? Or do you? Once they're up. She does, yeah. Q, cool. or she does, I don't know. You do. Have you got a good uh, pair of binoculars or something? Has to clear the trees first. Mm. And can you hear it as well? But obviously with a delay. Nice. That's so cool. Can't hear it now. It's a long way. Two hours. <sighs> right, any questions before I disappear on the stuff that we've covered tonight? I know we didn't get as far as perhaps we could have done, but we made some progress. I need to try and understand why iStudio doesn't update on any changes. I wonder if it will update when you reload the entire project. I wonder. Okay, let's just save this as a uh, test at the moment. Okay. And then I'm going to change one of these blocks, right? I'm going to change the description of What am I going to change the description of the output shift register description? See if it. So it says PIO output shifter right now. I'm just going to change that to output shifter. Okay. Save. Then I'm going to reopen this. Oh, I hate it when I do that. You know, you try and open that the first time, it opens the last file that you opened. Uh, I've changed the description to output shifter. Oh, that's a description. No, it says PIO output shifter still. So even though I've reopened that, it hasn't updated from the changes in the block. 
Oh, how annoying. I might need to ask uh, Jesus, one of the developer guy, about that. Right, I'm going to call it quits, guys, unless you've got any more questions, and we can do some more of this um, next week, if you like. Um, is everyone happy doing some more of this, by the way? I think it's worth spending some time doing this. I know it's a bit of fun. I post likes it. That's good. Nori, still there? Anyone else? Yeah, this is the iStudio stuff is really just for sketching it out. I mean, we can try some things. Uh, eventually, to do it properly, we do it in MMyGen because then you can use it to rep replicate any number of ports, etc. It gets easy to do. Cool. All right, well, I'll do a bit more then next week. Right, so until next week, I mean, there's obviously the forum. Well, yeah, that was my thinking as well, Laurie. Laurie says, uh, makes you learn what it does in detail. Yeah. It means that you've got to understand it, right? So let's do some more next week then. Otherwise, um, I may, may, I might post to this, possibly, uh, on the forum, and maybe put some of this stuff up on um, on GitHub or something as well, so you guys can play along if you like. Cool. Okay, well, let's call it quits for tonight. Thanks for joining me. Much appreciate it. Um, and I will speak to you guys either down at the forum or in a stream next week. For the boards, Laurie, well, it's for me, it's just getting at the moment, board wise, it's about getting this um, amalgam board done. Um, so that's all I'm focused on really in terms of board making uh, I've pretty much tied it down functionally schematic wise um, I've got to I've got to try a little bit of routing on the um, on the carrier the black stack carrier for amalgam so I just want to make sure that that works out nice, given the pins I've chosen for the amalgam board, because it's changed a bit since I last showed it you guys. Um, well, I can't do it until after, I wouldn't be able to get it manufactured until after the Chinese New Year anyhow, which is in Feb. But I have to prototype it first anyhow, so I've got a, and I'm not ready to order the PCBs yet, because it's not completely rooted yet. So it's going to be a couple of months. It's not going to, we're not going to see it until hmm. uh, depends what you mean by whether it's manufactured boards or prototype. I want to get a prototype. I'd love to get a prototype by the end of Feb. Let's put it that way. Depends on shipping and stuff as well. And then start getting them made in March. But your mileage may vary on that. So might mine. I need it as much as you do. Believe you me. But I need to get it right. I spent so damn long on this. And changed so many different things. Uh, I think at least I've got something stable now. And I'm just trying to optimise pinouts and routing. And things like that. And get it done. Cool. Right guys. See you down at the forum, or I will see you uh, on the next stream. Ciao.